Okay, please go on. Okay. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Güngör Usta. I am graduated, graduated from the uh, neurosurgery department of İzmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital. These online education meetings have started with Professor Hasan Kamil Sucu, the program manager of the neurosurgery department of İzmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital, and goes on with the contributions of all residents. Also with the contributions of neurosurgeons who graduated from the same department. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecturer to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions by writing to the chat part of Zoom program. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be discussed, uh, asked and discussed uh, by me to the lecturer. Uh, mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Please do not ask your microphone to be turned on. And now I would like to introduce our guest. It's my privilege to present our lecturer, Professor Julie A. Heitz. He is professor in physiotherapy at the School of Health Sciences and Social Work at Griffith University and the clinical director of the Matter Health Services Pet Research Clinic, Brisbane, Australia. He is a titled musculoskeletal physiotherapist and a fellow of the Australian College of Physiotherapists. Her current research interests include exercise, motor control training for low back pain, imaging as ultrasound or uh, an MRI, and prediction prevention of sports injuries, including concussion. At an international level, uh, she has been a collaborative scientist on several international multidisciplinary analog advisory groups, uh, astronaut studies with the European Space Agency. She was also a member of the Space Medicine and Life the Sciences Technical Advisory Group for the Australian Space Agency. Yes, uh, Professor, welcome again. We are listening you. to you. You can start your screen sharing. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Great. Lovely. Well, thank you for having me to speak with you tonight, today, this morning, wherever you may be, tonight for me. Um, I'm going to run you through some of the research work I've been involved in with uh, low back pain and multifidus, but I've also added some uh, work around some analog studies and some astronaut studies and some sports studies to see if we can really draw some threads together with regards to muscles mainly and exercise. And I'd like to give you some of the research that we've done on, on some back muscles. So let's see if it'll move for me. Hmm, just won't move, hang on. There we go. So we're going to start with some talking about back pain, which is probably um, what you're expecting me to talk about. And then we'll talk about these other topics, which maybe you weren't expecting, but I hope you enjoy. We'll talk about some bed rest studies, some parabolic flight studies, so analog studies for space research. I'd like to tell you some of the findings we've had with the astronauts and then talk about some sports research, which you might be thinking that's a bit of an eclectic uh, collection of topics, but it does have a common thread, which really is normal function, muscles, impairments, interventions, and exercise, which is my area and how we've used imaging in that as well. And we've done various types of studies, so cross-sectional, longitudinal studies, intervention studies, and I'll, I'd like to take you through some of, some of those. So if we start off with an area that's very familiar to you, low back pain, which of course is a very common problem and can be quite difficult for us to manage no matter what um, domain we're from. And I thought I'd put up uh, one of the think tanks from the NAS meeting in 2017, where a lot of clinicians from many disciplines were interviewed 
about what factors they thought influenced people with back pain and positive and negative influences. And um, some of these mind maps were really complex, some were less complex. And not every patient that we encounter has all of these factors, but certainly we can have quite complex cases on our hands when we're dealing with people with chronic low back pain. There was a series written in The Lancet, I think in 2018, which was really saying, come on, it's a call to action for low back pain, the time is now. And this is a really good series of articles. If you haven't read them, um, I think they were a really useful um, review suggestions for the future. Um, for, for all disciplines to actually read. And one of the things they talked about in the prevention and treatment of back pain and the, the challenges and the promising directions for the future, I think all of you would be aware of the biopsychosocial framework that we're dealing with with our patients with complex um, problems. And two things that they highlighted which really align with my line of work is um, self-management, education and exercise. And I suppose I've been in this profession for a long time now and there's been lots of things that have come and gone within physiotherapy in the last, I don't like to say how many years, quite a few years, but exercise has been one consistent um, approach that there's a lot of evidence for and certainly has given me the most satisfaction treating my patients that I see with low back pain. So I thought I'd just put up this model. You don't need to go into this in, in detail in any way, shape or form. But it was a, I was really privileged to attend this. It was a state of art of motor control training and low back pain um, held in line with one of the NAS conferences in Chicago and basically brought together experts from many disciplines to say, well, what consensus can we actually come to with respect to exercise for low back pain? And you may recognize some of the, the faces in that room. But basically what the model is actually saying is that if we look at physiotherapy management, um, tailored physio, psychological management, medical management, we're probably dealing with three basic categories of pain presentations. So nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and central pain. And of course, these probably lend themselves to different treatments. And certainly for physical management of people, this blue area, you can see that the wedge goes down in this direction. So no susceptive pain, obviously for physical treatments, that's um, you know, quite a, a big proportion of patients that we see for physiotherapy. Then neuropathic pain and central pain may require different elements of management. So I think that that really nice kind of framework, and we use this with our physiotherapy students to teach them that it is important for us to consider what kind of presentations the patients have and how well we can work with other health professionals to make sure that we actually optimise the, the treatment that our patients get and are really aware of when we should be referring or working with our colleagues from other disciplines to make sure that people get the, the, best, um, the best management possible. So I'm mainly talking to you about something from that little blue square and um, not only just the biological aspects, but the exercise aspects. And when you look at the human body and the intricacy of, of the muscles, you can see that there's lots of different options for exercise, but we're going to focus particularly tonight on the low back muscles. And this work stemmed from uh, the work on my PhD many years ago, which was when we first used imaging to look at the lumbar multifidus muscles in people with acute low back pain. And at that stage, people really hadn't paid much attention to imaging of the spinal muscles. And exercise for back pain was really quite, um, quite general. So we conducted this trial in a, in a hospital, in the Mater Hospital, where I still visit today. And from the emergency department, patients were actually sent down if they were having an acute episode of back pain. Um, one group had just standard advice to stay active and medical, um, like pharmacological management. And the other group actually had um, early intervention in the form of exercises where we looked at where the muscles had atrophied and used ultrasound imaging to give the patients feedback to learn how to control those muscles. And we all know that the short-term outcome or the natural history is thought to be really good for acute low back pain in that say 75, 85% of people won't have pain within four weeks in their first episode. But it's that recurrence rate that's staggeringly high. So we followed the patients for three years and found that um, the recurrence rate was certainly lower 
not perfect, but lower if we could actually intervene early, if we could find someone with an impairment in their muscles and intervene and restore the muscles, they seem to have better outcomes. And that was the first work that we actually did on that, on that muscle. So we know a lot more about it today. And of course, that work has evolved into um, a subacute chronic low back pain. And imaging often uh, includes muscles now, which it certainly didn't back in, in this time. And you mentioned that Gwen Jull has presented to your group before, and here she is in these papers because she was one of my uh, PhD supervisors. So if we think of what we know about the muscles today and the different phases of back pain, so acute and subacute and chronic, and in the acute phase, the muscles can be um, inhibited or they look smaller on imaging, but their consistency is the same. Whereas in this subacute phase, we start to see this adipose accumulation. And we'll talk about this in some other studies that are coming up because it always is next to the bone and it's commonest in this deep ventromedial corner. But in this subacute phase, they don't necessarily have true muscle atrophy. Whereas by the time you see your chronic patients, they have this fatty infiltration as well as they have true muscle atrophy. So there's been some, some studies done now, mainly in animal models, actually, but to really try and see if we can work out, because it's been a little bit of an enigma for quite a long time. And I suppose the burning question from neurosurgeons, physiotherapists alike is, can we change this? So we see this presentation all the time. What should we say to our patients about it? And is it something that we can actually even, even influence? So this is, again, this arises from a series of papers from that Chicago meeting. Uh, I can certainly pass on the references to that for them to you. But this, this was a summary of looking at the stages of back pain and the effects on the structure. And interestingly, in this acute phase, so this pale blue up the top, um, we think that you have this stimulation of your nociceptors and possibly a spinal cord mechanism like reflex inhibition. And that's why the muscles shut down and get smaller in size, but their consistency doesn't change. Yet during this subacute early chronic phase, these three months, and this has been, as I mentioned, mainly done in, in mice, you see this inflammatory response in the adipose tissue. So we're wondering really if it's that the adipose tissue actually then you know, perpetuates this, this problem of then this fatty infiltration. And by the time you get to this dark blue stage, your chronic, darker blue face, your chronic stage, they now have the true muscle atrophy. They may well have disuse and loading and other problems. But this, this phase is really quite interesting to us. And the reason that we, that we care is that the preliminary studies in animals show that if you can exercise in this phase, you can actually um, divert this inflammatory response so maybe you can stop people progressing to that stage where they're really quite hard to, to um, regain their motor control of their muscles and hypertrophy the muscles by this stage. So we would think that we really could be thinking a bit more as physiotherapists about selection of exercise based on modifying muscle structure. And it makes sense that if you see different changes in muscle at different times, that different types of exercise would be appropriate. So in this very early phase with the reflex inhibition, we'd be wanting to wake the muscle up and get the brain to start using it again. It's probably, you know, reflex inhibition, just like a knee joint injury and your spinal cord makes them shutting down your quads, which it thinks, quadriceps, which it thinks is protective, but that's not really likely to be a good long-term strategy. And you'd of course be wanting to rehabilitate your quadriceps in a person with a knee injury. So we want to facilitate the muscles in this early stage. In this middle stage, they should be doing some, some active exercise if they can, that's pain-free. And we're hoping we can actually then stop some of this um, major fatty infiltration. But by the stage that they're at, the um, nine to 12 months period, if they have true muscle atrophy and they have fatty infiltration, they'll need to load their muscles. They'll need to actually... Um, just like any other strengthening program, have to add load and resistance to actually get muscle hypertrophy. And there is um, some preliminary evidence in papers that if people with chronic low back pain can actually load their muscles and exercise, that not only can they hypertrophy their muscles 
decrease their disability, decrease their pain, but actually reverse that fatty infiltration. So this is a really, um, you know, promising promising line of work for us and it's sort of been the holy grail for many years as to can you actually change that fatty infiltration so when we talk about motor control training and the type of exercise we do for people with back pain I thought I might just provide a bit of a definition so we're all on the same page we would say motor sensory and central processes involved in control of posture and movement and we think that the way that the individual is loading their spine can perpetuate symptoms can create symptoms and that these are things that we maybe can change through exercise and if we can regain control and endurance of key muscles with a high um, concentration on function like when the patient comes in and tells us what they want to be able to do it'll be very different for different patients so we we like to use functional retraining and work with the patient to to get to do what it's when we say, why are you here? What would you like to be able to do? We like to work with them to try and get to that stage, which will be different in different people. So in that top left corner is um, Gunda Lembres. She is the physio from the European Space Agency. And this was doing some rehab after a prolonged bed rest study. And I'll tell you about some bed rest studies. But there's a high emphasis if you want to exercise the multifidus muscle on re-educating the lumbar lordosis because of course that's one of its roles. It's an anti-gravity muscle that controls the lordosis. So we work quite hard on that. This was an elite cyclist. So that was someone who had to be able to control their muscles in a very flexed posture. Um, this next one is, uh, is an AFL player and um, we we're doing some anti-gravity exercises that I'll tell you about. Certainly, if your unstable surfaces can make exercise harder, but if your arms are above your head, we like to see that you can have a lordosis and a kyphosis, so control of spinal position during loading. And we've used ultrasound imaging as feedback for, for people to show them how their muscles are actually, actually contracting. And this was the clinical commentary that arose from that Chicago meeting. So Paul, Professor Paul Hodges wrote the editorial and the one that I led, the group that I led in that, in that meeting was about there's all these different approaches for management of back pain and people use different terms or I do this kind of approach or that kind of approach. And this meeting was about, well, what do we have in common? Are there actually things in common that we all do? And should we be using this language where it sounds like it's all so different? Maybe we'd be better to have, draw those principles together and um, be a little bit more on the same page with, with um, what we're telling our patients and how we work with our colleagues. So this paper, I thought I might just tell you about, uh, this is a longitudinal cohort study. These are patients attending the Marta Back Stability Clinic, which is where I visit every second Friday. It's a research clinic. We collect data from the, the patients with their consent. And we have followed 775 patients through from arriving at the clinic and then having treatment. It is an exercise based clinic so maybe slightly biased the people coming are expecting exercise as a as a management if they've arrived to see us um, so we followed them up it was done by a person not one of us who actually reviewed the records of the patients looked at their clinical assessments that all had motor control training so they'd all had some kind of exercise intervention then the independent reviewer did the chart audit and what we really wanted to find was that when we think of exercise for back pain and we talked about how complex back pain can be, who's more likely to respond? Is there anything that we could ask or understand at that initial interview that would make us think, yep, you're a good candidate for exercise? So I wanted to see if they're actually predictors uh, and then we tested this on another sample. So one of the things that was quite important in this study and, and was quite important in our results is how we defined the types of low back pain. So acute low back pain, less than four to six weeks, chronic continuous low back pain, just continuous low back pain, minimal variation. But these last two were really quite interesting, chronic fluctuating or chronic recurrent. So the fluctuating group have pain all the time, but it can spike and go down again. But the chronic recurrent group are the group that come to you and say, oh, I can have a terrible episode, but in between I'm completely pain-free. 
And we often like that history. When people say that to us, we think, well, for exercise, that's great because they've got these pain-free periods when we can really work with them. But we had no evidence to suggest that that group would have better outcomes. So when we just looked at the clinical presentations, um, this was improvement or no improvement based on their, their pain reports at their final treatment session. The people that had more disability on the Roland Morris disability questionnaire, they had more pain on the visual analog scale and had pain for longer. It's probably not that surprising to you that they, they, they had better outcomes than people who had longer, longer durations of pain, more disability and more pain. So that probably is completely logical. But when you look at the duration of pain, I mean, these are really quite chronic groups that present to this clinic. So 30 to 42 or 43 months of pain. So these were some of the tests that we looked at to see if we could find variables that were predictive of a positive outcome. And we found four. So if the patients presented with back pain and didn't have scoliosis, they were more likely to improve, which possibly makes sense because they don't have a structural problem. Um, if we skip down to the bottom, if they didn't have back and hip pain, so the back and hip pain patients responded less well. The type of pain that they had, if they had chronic recurrent pain, so they had pain with episodes that were pain-free in between, they had better outcomes. So that really confirmed our, our impressions. But probably my favourite one, if they couldn't contract their muscles well, they responded better to exercise therapy. And that one, if there hadn't been any findings in relation to muscles, I would have been really shocked because this is what physiotherapy is based on. We try and see if there's an impairment in function or muscle control, and then we try and improve it. And then we see if that lines up with the patient's symptoms. So it was actually predictive if they couldn't contract their muscles. So back pain, where are we up to so far? We've talked about it possibly being quite complex at times, not always. And uh, that we consider that biopsychosocial model as being very important. There is evidence for exercise and self-management. Obviously, there's lots of different types of treatments available. And I discussed that hybrid model with you, which I think is quite helpful when we consider different types of pain. So now I'd like to give you some other studies just to um, highlight to you the changes in these muscles and if, see if we can pull the threads together and make a bit more sense out of maybe why uh, treating patients with this type of exercise is helpful. So we're gonna talk about two analog studies tonight. We're gonna talk about prolonged bed rest and parabolic flight. So prolonged bed rest studies, the most recent one that I was involved in was in, in Cologne and I'll tell you about that. This is people get put to bed for 60 days head down, six degrees down, head down tilt. And often there's interventions that are tried during the bed rest period. And then there can be reconditioning strategies that are tried after they get up from bed. So some of the earliest ones I was involved with were the Berlin bed rest studies. And uh, I was very fortunate to be able to, to work with the physio from ESA on the reconditioning post bed rest. So in these studies, uh, a lot of the analog studies and space studies prior to this point had been done on the leg because I suppose it's much easier to, to measure than the spine. But this is what happened to the back pain, to the, sorry, not back pain, to the subjects. These are normal healthy subjects and they're put into bed. This was an MRI and we can see the, mul the multifidus here. This is the start of bed rest and this is the end of bed rest. So if we go back to the start, and the end, you can see that your lumbar rectus spinae and your multifidus muscles don't really like bed rest. So they atrophy and they atrophy quite quickly. And you might think that if you went to bed for 60 days that all of your muscles would atrophy because you're not really moving around, lifting things, using them. But in fact, that's not the case. So if we look at these graphs on the y-axis is the percentage, either increase or decrease, 0% is the start of bed rest. And the BR values at the bottom of the graph, bed rest 14 is day 14 of bed rest. So 14, 28, 42, 56 for this study. 
And you can see in the graph on the left that the multifidus, that sort of gray, gray, grayish color, multifidus goes down quickly and continues to go down. Lumbar rectus spinae goes down as well. Quadratus lumborum doesn't really care. Abdominals get bigger. Psoas at the trunk gets bigger and rectus abdominis gets bigger. Or oh, funny, just a little bit of a down there for the abdominal, abdominal muscles. So this is quite intriguing to us because um, this happens in astronauts as well. They get muscle imbalance. So some muscles go up, some muscles go down when you remove gravitational loading. So the band rest studies, after they've done their 56 days or 60 days, depending on the study, they then go back to normal work, sport and leisure activities. And again, it would be quite intuitive to assume, oh, well, the muscles just must come back to normal when you start doing your normal work, sport and leisure. And interestingly, for the multifidus muscle, it was one of the few muscles that didn't come back. So again, we've got the percentage difference on the Y axis. On the X axis, you've got your bed rest dates again, and R stands for recovery. So recovery for 14, 28, 90, and 180. So 90 days later, after they'd finished the study and gone back to normal work, sport, and leisure, the muscles hadn't come back by themselves. So this is quite interesting because we see that this muscle can be quite hard to retrain in our back pain patients, but these aren't back pain patients. These are people where we've removed gravitational loading. So the role of the muscle, if you think when you're sitting upright, you're not on your chair, it's controlling your curve, it's buzzing along, it's, it's um, giving your brain feedback where you are in space. If you're lying down, you don't need it. And if you're in space, you probably don't need it. So it's, uh, it's quite a tricky muscle for us to really rehabilitate. So this was the Agbreza prolonged bed rest study in Cologne. So artificial gravity uh, bed rest study with ESA held in Cologne. And this was um, this fellow here on the slide, Nick Kaplan, is from North Northumbria University, and he led this project. And the intervention that they used while the people were in bed was a centrifuge to actually induce artificial gravity. So for 30 minutes, the people in the intervention group, their bed was wheeled into the centrifuge and then they were transferred onto the centrifuge and they were uh, spun for 30 minutes. So I've got a little video there so you can see the human centrifuge and they're still there six degrees um, head down in that study. So the idea being that if you actually induced a artificial gravity, it would actually maybe mediate some of these changes that we were seeing in bed rest. And actually the person in the previous slide is Dr. Enrico De Martini, who's a, uh, an Italian doctor who, who did all of the measurements on this study. Uh, and you'll see his name come up in the publications. So what did we find? We found that just like in the other bed rest studies, the multifidus decreased in size quickly and more than other muscles. And we also looked at the discs. So if you think of your diurnal cycle with your discs imbibing fluid at nighttime and then gravity compresses them again during the day, 60 days of bed rest, they often have a flattened lordosis and their disc height can increase. And in this study, we actually looked to see if fatty infiltration happened within 60 days. And we were quite intrigued to see that it, it does. So this is just normal, healthy people. They're put into bed. Um, not only do their muscles atrophy, but they st we start to see this fatty infiltration. So this color code is like a heat map, if you like, of the uh, the fatty infiltration. And you can see again, it happens in the next to the bone often in this deep ventromedial, just like with our corner, just like with our back pain patients. And it happened more just like our back pain patients at L5 and S1. And I put this in, this was actually, um, this is Vienna Tran, who was a medical student at the University of Adelaide who wanted to come on and do some, some studies with us. And she measured the gluteal muscles. And we certainly saw that there was atrophy in the, in the gluteal muscles as well. So if you think of the multifidus and gluteus maximus and medius and minimus, it makes sense that your hip extensors and your lumbar extensors are similarly affected. 
So this is one of the patients being tested. That's uh, Enrico doing his testing. And you can see that after 60 days of bed rest, his back is completely flat. And this is what we see in the astronauts as well. So whether it's the um, disc, increased disc height or um, the muscles not working properly or both. And in fact, one of the NASA studies suggests that it's quite correlated, that atrophy of multifidus correlates with the loss of the lordosis. But it's probably because they're in that kind of flexed posture. And if you think of trying to uh, emulate that on Earth, the closest thing that you can do on Earth to be like moving around the International Space Station is swimming underwater. So you're quite flexed using your arms. You don't need your back muscles. And um, that's possibly why we see these these these changes so Gunder and I got to actually rehab the patients after the Berlin bed rest studies and as I mentioned to you earlier Gunder looks after the astronauts prepares them I'll show you what she's doing while they're in space in a minute and does their reconditioning when they come home and it's quite important for the astronauts they don't like to be called patients because I suppose they're not patients and they don't like to be thought of as as sick so we talk about reconditioning not rehabilitation for the astronauts so i suppose that language is really quite quite important so the other analog study i thought you might be interested to have a look at and again nick kaplan's group from northumbria ran this one and i think in collaboration with the uk space agency but this is the parabolic flight i don't know if you've seen these before, but it can actually induce that short period of time of decreased um, gravity. And that's Enrico again running this study. We had a patient set up with, a, with sensors so that we could see his spinal position and his trunk was given a perturbation and we used EMG to have a look at what happened to his muscles. And this is only a really brief time of, um, of decreased gravity. So it was really interesting to see what would happen in that phase. And without having to run you through all of the results, all I wanted you to see from this graph is that in the period of perturbation, the muscles change their response. And this is just within, say, a 40-second window. So when we think of our body's response to different environments, it's rapid. It's incredibly rapid. And here's the parabolic flight for you to have a little look at. So that's the, the parabolic flight. And lastly, I'd like to talk to you about some of the, well, it's not lastly, actually, I'm going to talk to you about some sports stuff as well. But in this line, we can talk about some of the astronaut studies. So as I mentioned earlier, the after the bed rest studies as well, the, the posture in space is completely different. And there's been quite a few studies over the years looking at the effects of space flight on the intrinsic muscles and again they were really identified as a muscle group that actually decreased in size and decreased quickly and you possibly have some good ideas why that happens now um, this is Gunda the physio that I mentioned to you before and we've done a series of studies with ESA uh, one of the main interventions that they use is the advanced resisted exercise device the ARED 
And if you can imagine that it's quite challenging devising exercise for space, because obviously you can't just lift weights in space. And this device was, it's built on hydraulics and its idea is that it can actually give that axial loading that they don't have when they're in space. And when they're actually on this device, I've got some pictures coming, coming up for you. Gunda, or the physio from the European Astronaut Centre, is sitting at EAC and actually with a live video feed to the patients doing that, not patients, sorry, the astronauts doing their exercises. And this is really important because that multifidus and those deep muscles that control the spine and control the curve, your muscle spindles don't send normal impulse back to your brain normal messages without axial loading so they might be trying to lift quite heavy loads to try and maintain bone mass and muscle mass but they mightn't be able to feel well where they are in space so this is quite tricky if you think of weightlifters and how pedantic they are about keeping their curve in the right spot um, if they can't feel where they are it can be quite tricky to do this exercise well so Gunda has the live video linked to them and gives them feedback so you know your chin's drifted forward pull your chin back or your bottom's tucked under correct your curve this will not be possible though with the long duration missions they're considering to Mars because there won't be a direct video link and they won't fit something like the ARED on a on a ship that would be going to Mars so we've measured the astronauts before and after space flight and the multifidus muscle certainly does atrophy after space flight. And we've recently published a series of astronauts returning from the ISS. This picture on the far left is on Earth, and that's the astronaut learning how to do this exercise on Earth before they go up into the International Space Station. The other exercises that they do, like running on a treadmill with bungee cords, is more for cardiovascular fitness. And you can see that that ARAD, they can do that in different positions so they can do upper limb and other exercises as well. So it's a, it's a, a very um, clever device. But the results of this study, these are for different vertebral levels. So L2, L3, L4 and L5. And we're looking at the cross-sectional area of the multifidus. The red dashed line is the size of the muscles before they went up to the International Space Station for six months. And interestingly, just like our patients, there's different results for different vertebral levels. And the most atrophy occurs at L5-S1. So the L5 multifidus, it can though, with um, rehabilitation, they have uh, reconditioning. They have reconditioning daily from after they return from, from space. And again, in, within 15 days, they can actually recover their muscles, which is a bit different from what you might see in your chronic low back pain patients. So it's a different population. It's a brilliant population to study because they don't actually have pain and they're going to have a predictable response to the environment that we put them in. So if you wanted to trial different, different studies, this is a great population to do it on. They're really fit. You know, they're going to actually, they're going to have this stimulus. It's going to affect their muscles. And then you could certainly um, try different approaches out. So you might be thinking that all sounds fun, which it's certainly a great group to work with, but there aren't many astronauts. I think the point is that we can learn so much from that group and there's such direct parallels with so many conditions that we see on Earth. So whether it's um, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, low back pain, um, this, is, this is really useful research and we've written a couple of papers looking at that uh, terrestrial and uh, rehabilitation, astronaut reconditioning, how it's a reciprocal knowledge transfer. We can learn both ways from that. And certainly they're trying to learn from rehab on Earth to consider how they're going to solve the problem of getting to Mars without having a direct video link or devices like the ARED. So why would we study bed rest and gravity, drawing parallels between those Changes that occur in the neuromuscular system can help us to better understand and tailor interventions for our terrestrial populations is why we think it's so important. All right, we're going to talk a little bit now about um, sport and elite athletes. So this, again, has been a really interesting group to work with. And I think when we think of our really fit athletes, you wouldn't think that half of most of the teams have back pain at any particular time. So back pain is very common in athletes, but that I was actually invited into some studies with cricketers 
around fast bowling because of back pain. But why I was invited to some studies with teams like uh, Australian football, AFL, is that they have so many soft tissue injuries. So AFL, they can run half a marathon in a game. So it's an unusual game if you haven't seen AFL before. Um, so their idea was if they improved the control of the trunk, maybe they could have less lower limb injuries. So this line of research was looking at the relationship between lumbar pelvic muscle size and control to sports injuries and low back pain. And as I mentioned, quite a high rate of injuries in, in this type of football and the Australian football. And we were, again, looking at the trunk muscles. So after a whole series of studies, and I'm going to go into all of them here, it is interesting that this muscle just comes up so often in research. But in fact, the size of the muscle was actually predictive of lower limb injuries. So a lot of the teams now have, have wanted to trial interventions to see if we can actually decrease injuries. And we've published a, a series of studies now looking at the effect of motor control training. And the main metric for AFL is games missed. And I think this is not only important for the poor players, as well as in competitions, the teams that can keep their players on the field with the least injuries are more likely to win the competition. So there's a lot of people that can benefit if we can prevent any of these injuries, which is often for these sports hamstring injuries. And I thought you might like to see this. When we have to write grants now, I'm sure you're in the same boat, um, we have to actually show that our research has impact. So has it actually affected someone else? Uh, has it actually um, made a change? So this was an impact case study we did with the Brisbane Lions. And the context of the problem, they were worried about their sports injuries and players being unavailable for competition. And it's always nice with a, uh, with a study in industry if someone approaches you and says, hey, can you, can you help with this? That's a great way to then actually design a study together and, and see if it is effective. So what we actually did was worked with the club to see if we could actually work out which players were more likely to be, um, to be injured. And you can see us at the club measuring some of the players here. AFL, they're very tall, a lot of these players. So those, those two on the beds there would be well and truly over six foot, probably closer to seven foot. They're really tall players. It's quite a demanding game where they jump up in the air and can get tackled from any direction and um, run, run a long way. So we did actually find that we could measure them at the start of, of the season, track them over seasons and see if it could actually be related to injury. And then the club devised an intervention study based on what the muscle does and how you train it to actually see if they could then change the number of games missed. So they've done this, they did it over a four year period and then they evaluated the games missed. And this is the statistics from all of the clubs in the Australian Football League, Brisbane Lions over here, the rest are de-identified. Now, not just from doing what they did with us, obviously, it was part of their program, but they managed to have the lowest number of games <laughs> compared with other clubs. And lastly, I thought I might just mention a current study that we're doing with the University of um, Tasmania, um, looking at axial spondyloarthritis. And I've supervised a, a, a lovely student from um, the University of Tasmania, Janet Milner, and she's actually a rheumatological physiotherapist. So she actually came to me many years ago and said, you know, those changes that you talk about in back pain, well, you should see the changes in um, ankylosing spondylitis. So we've looked at a series of images now, and we was just down in Tasmania a couple of weeks ago with my colleague Delani, and this is Janet, and we've pulled all this data. We're working with Jim Elliott at University of Sydney on artificial intelligence and machine learning to see if we can actually automate the measurement of these muscles. So instead of us sitting there manually tracing around them, we're going to use the ankylosing spondylitis patients to see if we can actually automate this, this measurement. And I've got a couple of the images here to show you. So again, you'll note that the changes, the fatty infiltration is always in that deep ventromedial corner, even in an inflammatory arthritis. 
And of course, if you think of the enthesis organ and what they talk about with um, axial spondyloarthritis, it probably makes complete sense that that's where you see these changes, but they're dramatic. They're absolutely dramatic. And if we look at further downstream in advanced ankylosing spondylitis, you can see the muscle is almost complete, completely full of fatty infiltration. So I think I've whipped you around a lot of research on different areas. I hope that has been of um, interest to you. These are the, the folk I work with at Griffith University and the Mater Hospital, and Mel works at the University of Queensland. And that's some of the groups that I've worked with and different um, teams and funders. And um, I've been very fortunate to work with some very amazing people. So that is it from me. Will I stop sharing that one? Yes. Uh, Professor, thank you for this useful lecture. Uh, and I think we have to be more interested in this subject. We are surgeons. Uh, we operate the people, but we have to learn more than uh, more about conservative education or recovery. Uh, I will read the questions and comments. Uh, I want to ask first question. Uh, what do you want to say about the exercises after back surgery and when? The uh, patients uh, ask uh, always, but I, I think there is no consensus. No, I'm oh, sorry, go on. Uh, did you finish, uh, Ginger? Yes. Okay. It's the question, that's all. What do you want to say about uh, exercises after back surgery? No, it's necessary it's, or... Okay. It's a very good question. And uh, I'd be really interested to hear what you as a group think too, because often I don't know what it's like where you are, but in Australia, patients get physio in hospital but then they usually go home and they're on their own. Um, the only ones that end up back at physio are the ones that have problems. So um, I don't know, should we be doing something better in between? And maybe for the majority of patients, they're going really well. They get given good programs and they're, they're fine. But there certainly is a category that, that don't do so well. So I, I don't know, how is it managed where you are? Do they routinely see a physio and get given exercises? Yeah, uh, if you if can go ask, if the patient asks us after the operation, he went to the operation and it's finished, he is well or she is well, and she is asking to us, did you, uh, should I make exercise? Which answer? When, when will I start the exercises? When, this is the most question. Uh, when the patient start the exercise? <laughs> well, I suppose most in most cases in Australia, they'll start while they're in hospital, very gentle exercise. And of course, the motor control training, one of the things that we see, which I haven't talked about with you today, but I'm sure you've seen it with your patients, is those patients that have increased activity of muscles. So those poor patients that are very anxious, fight or flight, shoulders around their ears, can't breathe properly. In Australia, they'd be taught to actually start to use their diaphragm again, start to try and use you know, their, their pelvic floor and their back muscles. So it's not even always increasing activity of muscles. For some of your patients, it's decreasing activity of muscles. And the other factor that might get them referred to outpatient services is their work demands. So I think, thinking, reflecting on that, it probably the ones that really do get sent more routinely might be people that have really high work demands. And I think you think, well, they're going to need more conditioning before they go back to roofing or like a really heavy manual job. So they can start pretty early a modified form of exercise. I think probably here in Australia, most of the, most people who aren't in heavy jobs do walking programs and very general exercise. 
And that might be good in that inflammatory phase that we spoke about. But certainly if they have atrophy, they may well need, especially if they have a heavy job, they may need to be coming back to, to, to physio. Would be my thoughts. Thank you. The second question is, uh, is the bed rest done in the head down position? Why? Yes, it is. It's done in um, six degrees head down tilt. And they have um, guidelines for how these studies have presented, but it's not just musculoskeletal research. So if you think of space and the effect on your blood vessels and you like <coughs> the, um, the head sort of swell, I suppose this is for your, your cardiac research and your all the other systems that people are looking at. So it's not like space, obviously, because you can't move around, but I suppose that pressure and that, that shift in your um, blood volumes is probably achieved why they want the six degrees head down tilt. Uh, Dr. Murad Shaki, uh, is it only multifidus that makes patients feel back, love, uh, back pain following fatty infiltration or a combined effect of fatty infiltration in both multifidus and erector spina? It certainly can occur in both the multifidus and the lumbar erector spinae. It's just been an interesting finding that the multifida seems to be a marker. It seems to be the muscle that's affected first and the most. But no, it certainly can affect the uh, lumbar erector spinae as well. And you saw that in the images, especially of the um, ankylosing spondylitis patients. So those muscles work together, of course. The multifidus has that really um, segmental innovation. So medial branch of your dorsal ramus and the, the, you know, the really nice lumbar erector spinae um, isn't doesn't have that same segmental control, but they both work together. Multifidus controls the rocking action of the vertebra in forward flexion and coming back to extension, but it's it's in placed in a place where it can't really control shear, which is more what lumbar erector spinae does. So you need both of those muscles to work together and function. Okay, uh, the second part of the question, what is the role of psoas muscle in back pain? Psoas is such a controversial muscle. So if you read the literature, you'll see people that say that psoas atrophies. Um, if you read other literature, you'll say that it see that it doesn't. You'll see that um, people say there's fatty infiltration in the muscle. There's other people that say it's completely spared from fatty infiltration. Uh, it's a very interesting muscle. I think the jury is probably well and truly out on what happens to multifidus and um, psoas in back pain. It doesn't seem to, in the analog studies or the astronauts, it doesn't seem to be a muscle that generally is prone to atrophy. But in some studies, people have reported that it, that it um, atrophies. I've got a student looking at the moment in um, AFL players at the relationship between the spinal curves and psoas because a lot of physios release psoas and do a lot of work with that muscle. And I think that it's been a pretty held theory that it was directly related to posture but the preliminary results from this study would suggest that it's it's not correlated whereas in in astronauts multifidus is correlated to the lordosis so i, I i'd have to say that um you'll have to we'll have to all wait and see what happens with psoas the jury is well and truly still out thank you what is the best exercise for the ordinary people, not so fit, for the multifidus muscles? Yeah, I think I think that if you think of the muscles function is that it's to control your lordosis in upright loading. Possibly the easiest way for most of us to kick this muscle in is through our posture. So an absolute killer of the muscle is sitting in front of your computer like this. I mean, you may as well be in space if you hunched over, chin poked forward, and your pelvis is rolled backwards. So one of the key things, especially with people coming in with back pain who are sitting at a computer, would be to really talk to them about posture. Because as soon as you can correct that posture and actually have a curve, be using anti-gravity muscles in an anti-gravity role, um, that functional use of the muscle is probably the best way for all of us to keep our muscles healthy. And if you think even of leaning forward, as soon as your center of gravity is forward of your base, your body has to use your extensor muscles so that you don't just 
crumple forwards. So even how we move is really important for these muscles. So I think for the ordinary, ordinary person, that's where I would definitely start. Okay. Another question from Murat Shakir. Do minimally invasive surgeries have a real impact on paraspinal muscles? What's your experience? Um, minimally invasive yeah. surgeries affect paraspinal muscles or not? Do the minimal, in minimally invasive surgeries affect the muscles? Yeah. I suppose they do because you probably, you know more about this than myself, you probably need to have access. But, I mean, whether it, whether it heals completely, I, I don't know. Certainly minimally invasive has got to be better. I think when I was a young physio and I used to hear people talking about people who just used to cut the muscle out and throw it in the bin, it's just that muscle stuff, we don't worry about it. You would never hear a surgeon say that now. So I think surgeons are very respectful of muscles and I would guess that the less, the less in the minimally invasive surgery is the less invasive it can be, the better, but I'd be, I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Um, okay. What would, what would you think as a group that it's really important to preserve the muscle? Yeah. Sure. Question from Professor Bektash Atikas. Thank you, Professor, for the excellent presentation and sharing your great work with us. Could you please kindly tell your experience with swimming? Swimming swimming is a really interesting exercise. And of course, there's a whole, um, whole basis, a whole group of physiotherapists who do hydrotherapy, especially in Australia, where there's um, obviously lots of outdoor activity. Swimming is great in a phase where you don't want someone to load terribly highly and of course in aqua aerobics depending on how high the water is will vary how much loading there is on on the body for actual swimming though it seems to be a great exercise for someone who has swum before because it's so reliant on their technique so it can be really difficult for someone who gets told to swim if they've never swum before and their technique is terrible to do well with swimming because you need adequate thoracic rotation. You need adequate cervical rotation to be able to breathe when you do it. So it can be a wonderful form of exercise, but it can also be that people can be told, oh, swimming would be good for you. But if they have poor technique or have never swum before, it can be problematic. The other thing with swimming is you feel so good in the water that patients will generally overdo it. So if you have patients saying, would it be good for me to swim? Probably one of the best advice you could give them is, look, the first time, just do one lap and hop out because you'll hear time and time again that people say, I felt so good, but then I couldn't walk for five days. So it's just you haven't got that normal input while you're swimming. So it can be great. They just need to have adequate technique, take it slowly, and it is important that they do know how to swim. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Edwin Basby from Bulgaria. He has some several questions. Do you advise people to exercise their abdominal muscles in order to reduce low back pain? Yeah, absolutely. Time. And we didn't talk about the abdominals at all today, but we've done lots of research on the abdominal muscles as well. And the reason that is so important is that your <coughs> diaphragm and its coordination with your abdominal muscles, your pelvic floor muscles and your back muscles, they're all neurophysiologically linked. So we can, we can teach people to activate different muscles. The abdominal muscles, the deepest abdominal muscle, the transversus abdominis, it's a bit like the multifidus. It's a muscle that's on a little bit all the time. So we do train people with feedback how to use that muscle well. And it's um, it, very linked to breathing, very linked to posture, and uh, yeah, very important muscles, absolutely. Okay. Edwin has a two long questions. I will turn on Edwin's microphone. And uh, thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. I would like to ask one uh, several more questions. Do you, uh, we see many patients with sacroiliac joint pain in uh, our, our outpatient clinics? Do you advise these people to train if you do so? When do you uh, advise them to train? During their acute pain or uh, after this acute pain is gone? Yeah, they can be really tricky, um, sacroiliac joint. So um, are these 
um, pregnant patients, non-pregnant patients. Non, obviously, non -pregnant. Preg obviously, pregnant SIJs are really hard to handle because you've got that biomechanical change in the body. For people that aren't, aren't pregnant, they're probably ones that are really good in the acute phase to exercise in water if they can because it's so important for them to move, but they're so easily stirred up. So you can try things like your sacroiliac belts. I use this kind of regime with patients because the transversus abdominis muscle is so important for force closure of the sac sacroiliac joint. So, you know, form closure, you've got your undulating joint surfaces and your big ligaments, but there's also this form closure and Chris Schneider's from the Netherlands did uh, a lot of work on that and how effective the especially abdominal muscles but the multifidus as well they are in promoting this warm closure so we certainly teach patients how to activate these muscles how to breathe how to avoid again that really overactivity but they it can take a while to to build them up they're tricky to treat and probably earlier on exercise in water before you can progress them to too much land-based activity would be my thoughts Thank you. And I have one more question. Uh, uh, during the surgeries, we often make pedicle screw fixation surgeries and patients ask when we ca can go back to our normal pre-traumatic physical activity. Uh, what kind of advice would you give us when to tell them go back to gym or go back to make sport or to your hard work? When, when to do that? So are you saying for um, screw fixation? Yes. So I always make sure that they've spoken to, to, um, to you and your colleagues because obviously you know what has actually happened. And I do find in Australia certainly that people will have different recommendations for different patients. So I suppose it's the same where you are. It can be quite different. Um, and I suppose it depends on what you thought at the time of surgery that they would get, would get back to and how how well the surgery has gone. I imagine that's really quite varied. I don't see a lot of people post uh, internal fixation surgery. So I guess as long as the physio is really working closely with the neurosurgeons to make sure that it's safe to do so. Because I suppose one of the biggest things that we see is that fear factor, that if we're, if we're confident that everything is fine and that you're saying they can surgery was a success they can go back to it our job is to support that and really help the person to learn how they can do things safely and in line with their job requirements or their sport requirements thank you thank you very much thank you uh, there is a comment from professor he says we have compared Microsurgery versus large muscle dissection in lumbar surgery. Microsurgery has positive effect on preventing multifidus atrophy. I think if it can be, yes, the, the less less trauma to muscles. I think we're all on the same page these days. We want we want to try and preserve as much muscle as we can. We know how important muscles are. The expecting thing. I think there is no question or comment. Well, that was a lot of that was a lot of fairly hard questions for ten o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> you put me through my paces. I thought you'd all be snoozing off by now. <laughs> no, it's three p.m. night here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Professor Heights, for your excellent question uh, lecture. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Thank you. I will. And thank you, Professor. Meeting.